Hydrogen is the future of the automotive industry. You hear that everywhere. But will it really be the future? There are already many articles and videos on this topic. Actually, I thought the subject was already finished and closed. So why this one? Well, there's still a lot of controversy, often on a weak knowledge base. Even very well-known professors make demonstrably false arguments. What I want to give you in this video is a concise summary of all arguments. Plus arguments that hydrogen fuel cell cars will prevail and minus arguments against it. So will most of us be buying hydrogen cars in 2030? There is still this widespread hopeful thought. In 10 years, we will be able to drive with hydrogen without any problems, refuel 800 kilometers of range in a few minutes without any local emissions, and all is good. Battery electric cars are therefore only a temporary transitional technology, so you might as well buy a combustion engine car once again. But let's take a closer look. We're looking at passenger cars here and light commercial vehicles, the vehicles that you and I use most. And I'm looking at this from a car buyer's perspective because they are the ones who are predominantly deciding whether the hydrogen fuel cell car or the battery electric car will prevail. Why are the combustion engine cars missing as an option? I demonstrated this in another video a few weeks ago. I'll add a link to it. And by the way, this is not a forecast for 2030, but my assumption about the future. And there is a significant difference. Forecasts are supposed to predict the future. The forecaster wants to be exactly right in a few years from now. But assumption means, after all that can be known today, we assume the following future so that we can make decisions now. And in a month or a year's time, we check and correct our assumption about the future. That's what every entrepreneur and leader does. Base strategic decisions on assumptions about the future. And let me also say this. Our clients in the automotive industry are all suppliers to the combustion engine industry. Nobody is paying for this video. It is simply my and our assumption at the Future Management Group. Let's make a list of balance of arguments. All these arguments have been put forward by experts and can be verified in the sources. You will find the text of the video, even more details, and all sources with the link I attach. Plus, arguments speak for a future in which car buyers predominantly choose hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles HFC EVs, and minus arguments speak against it, so that most of them choose battery electric vehicles BEVs. And there are zero arguments that apply equally to both types of drive. If I use BEVs for a comparison, then of course I use those offered by the leading supplier Tesla. They show today what the other manufacturers will also be capable of in 5 or 10 years, presumably. Let's first look at convenience and refueling at first. With 5 minutes for one tank filling, refueling a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle is significantly faster than charging a battery electric vehicle. It takes an additional 5 to 10 minutes for a hydrogen pump to be ready for refueling after one or few refueling operations which means until the fueling pressure is built up again. This means that only four to six cars per hour can be charged or filled at one pump. But for the foreseeable future, that is still faster than charging a battery electric vehicle for 500 kilometers. A future disadvantage must not be overlooked. Even in 10 years, fuel cell vehicles will hardly be able to be charged faster than today. Even then, it will still take about 10 minutes. Battery electric vehicles will be chargeable much faster in 10 years, so the lead is melting away. The solid state batteries that can be charged 500 kilometers in 5 minutes are still somewhat speculative, so we'll leave them out of this equation here. So this is a plus for the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. The range of a hydrogen fuel cell electric car is about the same as that of a battery car. Hyundai Nexo has 540 km, Toyota Mirai 500, the next generation even 650, and the Mercedes GLC F cell is 500. Unfortunately, you can only lease a Mercedes, not buy it, and only if you have a company, for whatever reason. A real move towards the future would look differently. But the current electric cars actually match these ranges. Tesla Model 3, 560 km, Tesla Model S, 640. Greater ranges can be expected equally through larger tanks or batteries, and through advances in efficiency in both types of drive. 
There are fuel cell cars announced with 800 and 1000 km of range. But these announcements are matched by battery electric vehicles. The Tesla Cybertruck with 800 km and the Roadster of Tesla with 1000 km. So altogether, range is a zero argument. You can never refuel a hydrogen car at home. Not with friends and only with a very few employers and customers. Not even in 2030. You always have to drive to a hydrogen gas station to refuel. A battery electric vehicle is usually charged at home while you sleep or enjoy your leisure time or at work and only needs to be plugged in and unplugged twice a week. This is perfectly sufficient for almost all drivers, except for the long distance drivers. Only they have to plug in for 30 minutes every 3 hours and drink coffee, eat something or go to the toilet. While the charging speeds keep increasing and the charging times are getting shorter and shorter. Really problematic and challenging is a battery electric vehicle still today for tenants without their own parking lot. For this purpose, charging facilities need to be built in public car parks, at shopping centers or at workplaces. The energy suppliers are pretty confident about the possibility of expanding the electricity grid. I therefore justifiably assume that there will be great progress in this area in the next few years until 2030. The variety of charging options or fueling options is a negative argument, a minus argument against the hydrogen car even in the long run. From a European perspective, there are 134 hydrogen gas stations all over Europe in August 2020. In Germany, 84. That's 60% of all European gas stations. This means that you virtually cannot go on holiday by car if you're from Germany because the remaining hydrogen filling stations are spread all over Europe. France has 5, Austria 5, Switzerland 3, Belgium 2, the Netherlands 3. But it will certainly get better in the future, right? Yeah, could be. You just have to know that a hydrogen filling station, a single one, costs more than 1 million euros to build alone and is also expensive to run. While a charging station with 6 to 8 charging points costs a tenth, a little over 100,000 euros and requires hardly any maintenance. More on this later. So the current and very likely the future number of refueling or charging possibilities is a minus against the hydrogen fuel cell car. The current hydrogen vehicles all have a much smaller trunk, a much smaller luggage space than battery electric vehicles because a fuel cell vehicle simply has to accommodate more components. For reasonable and comfortable driving, the performance of a hydrogen fuel cell car is absolutely sufficient, just like with a BEV. But this is a zero argument, so it works for both. If you want to enjoy great acceleration and do so more often, you will have less fun with a fuel cell car than with a battery car. If you want to have acceleration of 4 seconds or less from 0 to 100 kilometers, 0 to 60 miles, which quite many people still like, you can do that with a hydrogen car today. Because a small buffer battery doesn't allow permanent dynamic driving. And if the batteries were bigger, you could do without the fuel cell and the tank entirely and then have a battery electric vehicle. Hydrogen tanks are now just as safe as gasoline and diesel tanks. But all three types of tanks are more flammable than batteries. Battery electric vehicles burn at least five times less often than gas and diesel cars. In percent, of course, not only in absolute numbers. Some studies even say it's 20 times less often based on the distance driven. But let's stick to the five times less frequently. A hydrogen car gas station has already exploded in Norway and in the United States. A charging station hasn't exploded yet. Electricity is transported via power lines. Hydrogen has to be transported to the gas stations with tank trucks. And by the way, with many more trucks than for gasoline and diesel, as we will see later. So safety is therefore rather a minus argument against the hydrogen car. Fuel cells are energy converters. First, electricity must be used to produce hydrogen and then the hydrogen must be used again to generate electricity. In each case, with high energy losses and reduced efficiency. For purely physical reasons, fuel cells can therefore never be as efficient as a battery that directly stores and directly provides electricity. Even if fuel cell technology makes great progress, New rules of physics would have to be discovered in order to make up for this disadvantage in efficiency. And as a footnote, it would actually be more efficient 
more environmentally friendly and cheaper to use hydrogen at the fueling station to generate electricity and then charge electric cars if it was not for the charging time. Yes, there is still the direct combustion of hydrogen in internal combustion engines, which would work with some modifications of the engine. But that means an even worse efficiency, even worse than gasoline and diesel. BMW, for example, already set this idea aside in 2009. And a second footnote, e-fuels reach a maximum efficiency of 15%, so they're not an alternative for mass mobility. There are various overviews, and each of them is controversial in detail. But if we take a look at the basic ratio, we can state that out of 100% energy used for a fuel cell electric vehicle, at the source, about 20% to a maximum of 30% arrive at the wheels. Of 100% energy, used for a battery electric vehicle, about 70% to 90% end up on the wheels. From my own experience, I would doubt the 90%, so let's take 80%. And then use the average values, which is 25% and 75%. So we come to the simplifying conclusion that hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles need three times more energy than battery electric vehicles. And this is three times more expensive. There are also calculations that arrive at five times the amount of energy, but let's leave this aside. So those who ask where all the electricity for better electric vehicles is supposed to come from and then claim that hydrogen must be the solution, they obviously haven't done their physics homework. Even if all cars, for example in Germany where I live, were fully electric, we would only need a maximum of 20% more electricity in Germany. And by the way, one-third of this 20% is already sold or given away to other countries. But if all cars in Germany were hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles, we would need at least 60% more electricity. And that is then a completely different and enormous challenge. How's the car buyer affected by this? You? Quite simply, the energy costs of a fuel cell electric vehicle must inevitably be three times higher for the same distance than with a battery electric vehicle. So you don't even have to care about efficiency and the regenerative nature of electricity. For the most part, for the driver, we'll count what goes out of his or her wallet. Some say that energy doesn't matter when we have an abundance of energy. Yeah. But first, we are far away from having an abundance of renewable energy. And secondly, energy will still not be totally free. Who will pay three times more when they can pay a third for the same distance? The production of hydrogen will only become cheaper if the energy becomes cheaper. But this means that electricity will also become cheaper for battery electric vehicles to the same extent. If the electricity becomes more expensive, then both types of drive become equally expensive or cheaper. Of course, it goes without saying that the weight of the vehicles of both types of drive is already included in these calculations. And the weight hardly differs anyway. A Toyota Mirai weighs about as much as a Tesla Model 3 with the same range. And by the way, a BMW 3 Series also weighs almost as much as those cars. So efficiency and cost, in particular, is a central minus argument against the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. The best fuel cells are good for up to 400,000 kilometers. Today's batteries are similar, but Tesla and later others will introduce batteries for 1 million miles, 1.6 million kilometers, which still then have 70 to 80% of their capacity after that. It is rather unlikely that fuel cells will now make such a leap after decades of research. Yes, electric cars have also been around for a long time, more than 120 years, but not lithium-ion batteries. Development of lithium-ion batteries for cars virtually started in 2003. Batteries are also very stable in practical use. It hardly ever happens that a battery simply breaks completely. Fuel cells are rather sensitive. A battery is considered to be ready for a second life at 70 to 80% of its capacity. This is followed by another 10 or more years as stationary storage in households or in businesses. The second life is in principle also possible for fuel cells, but it starts earlier and is shorter than with batteries. As a result, this means that the roughly equal purchase price of hydrogen cars and battery cars is spread over fewer years of service in the case of the hydrogen car, and thus the depreciation in value per year is higher. The depreciation in value depends on the purchase price and the duration of service. We've already mentioned the disadvantage of durability. 
The purchase price depends strongly on the components used and the number of units sold. Battery electric vehicles are much simpler and can be built smaller than hydrogen cars. Most suppliers have not even started with the small battery electric vehicles. The price reduction potential is therefore better with battery electric vehicles. Yes, China has reduced the subsidies for battery electric vehicles and will soon abolish them completely. This is absolutely right, because the better product will prevail anyway. Subsidies are almost always unnecessary and harmful. But for the time being, China has only cut the subsidies for small battery electric vehicles with small ranges, so that the cars have more range and become more suitable for everyday use. In China, the combustion engines are to be completely replaced by battery electric vehicles. Hydrogen fuel cell cars are only subsidized to a relatively small extent. As a result, buyers of a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle will have a higher loss of value per year. Fuel cell vehicles are much more complicated in structure. They have everything that an electric car has, a better electric car, but in addition they have a sensitive fuel cell, a high-tech tank and other specific components. Fuel cells are very sensitive. They have to be drained against sub-zero temperatures, preheated for operations and cooled during operation. The intake air must be very clean and strongly filtered to protect the cell membranes. Fuel cells provide constant energy. In order to be able to accelerate more and also to preheat the fuel cell, a battery is needed, albeit a very small one. The small battery in a hydrogen fuel cell electric car must tolerate many more charging cycles than a large battery in a pure electric car and therefore degrades more quickly. The tank is now a masterpiece of engineering. After all, it has to withstand 700 atmospheres of pressure. 200 to 300 times more pressure than in your tires. Meanwhile, hardly any hydrogen escapes through the tank walls as it used to be, but the tank is expensive to produce and has to be tested and maintained. It takes up as much space as a diesel tank, although only a few liters can be stored. So it should be clear that a fuel cell electric vehicle cannot be and will not become cheaper to maintain than a battery electric vehicle in the long term. Some say that hydrogen cars are being promoted so that customers will continue to have to spend a lot of money for maintenance in garages. But these higher maintenance costs cannot be hidden from the customers. They will understand which kind of drive is more expensive and what is cheaper. The costs for the infrastructure, which is the necessary amortization of the investments, will ultimately have to be covered by the car buyers and drivers. And this infrastructure will have to be built up almost completely and quickly. Whereas the electricity infrastructure already exists, for the most part, and only needs to be expanded and strengthened step by step. The storage of hydrogen is dangerous and therefore highly regulated. The production, transport and fueling stations must be intensively secured and tested. The prescribed tests and maintenance for a hydrogen filling station alone are said to amount to over half a million euros per year. Such costs are far greater than those for charging stations. If hydrogen is not produced at the gas station, which would increase the cost per station from one to several million, the hydrogen has to be transported to the gas stations by trucks. Even on the truck, you need 700 atmospheres of pressure or cooling to minus 253 degrees Celsius over the entire distance. These are very expensive tanks and very expensive trucks. A normal tank truck can only transport much less kilowatt hours in the form of hydrogen than in the form of diesel or gasoline. It is estimated that hydrogen mobility would require 10 times more tank trucks compared to today's fuel supply at gas stations, all loaded with quite dangerous hydrogen. Pipelines and the gas network are out of the question from a purely technical physical point of view, because they would have to be built from scratch for hydrogen, every inch of them using the expensive technology of tanks. The existing gas infrastructure is completely unsuitable. Instead of liquefying hydrogen with 700 atmospheres pressure or cooling it to minus 253 degrees Celsius, it could also be bound in an organic substance. These are so-called liquid organic hydrogen carriers, LOHC. This would save the cost for compression or cooling, but then the efficiency would be even lower because the hydrogen would have to be bound once more and then released again. In addition, 
you would have to have a huge tank in the car because of the much higher volume. So the efficiency would drop even further and the cost would be higher. And the number of trucks necessary would once more be much higher. My conclusion? Because hydrogen requires an extensive and expensive infrastructure for production, transport and thousands of fueling stations, the cost can never be as nearly as low as the cost for BEV's power supply. The customer doesn't care about that, you say? Well, he or she has to pay for it all. And then customers become very critical and very stingy. Hydrogen cars, like battery cars, can potentially be operated with 100% renewable energy. So this is a zero argument that applies to both types of drive. In addition, both types of vehicles can in principle be produced with regenerative energy. However, this is still a long way off. Even though Tesla has announced that in a few years' time, they will also be able to produce its batteries with regenerative energy, which means without any CO2 emission at all. Today, batteries are only partly produced with renewable energy, and hydrogen is mainly produced from natural gas. So, for the time being, there are problems on both sides. A study by Fraunhofer in Germany on behalf of H2 Mobility states that hydrogen cars are more climate-friendly than battery cars from a range of 250 kilometers or more. But the study is being paid for by a hydrogen consortium. And they recommend to build both technologies and both infrastructures side by side. No one will pay for this. The customers will have to make a decision. Fuel cell electric vehicle or battery electric vehicle. CO2 emissions will unfortunately not be the central criterion for them. Since both cause similar CO2 pollutions and can potentially become CO2 neutral, I consider this argument to be a zero argument. A hydrogen car can be seen as less critical as to raw materials. Essentially, only platinum is being discussed, but it has already been greatly reduced. In the battery electric vehicle, there is an extensive and predominantly emotional debate about raw materials. The most apt argument is the relatively small amount of cobalt obtained through illegal child labor. Child labor is unacceptable from our point of view, from yours as well, period. However, cobalt is a byproduct of copper production, so practically the entire electronics industry should be blamed. But it was not until the battery electric vehicle came and this became an issue. It is important to know that the proportion of cobalt in modern batteries has already been reduced to a sixth, and next generation batteries are expected to be completely without cobalt. The consumption of drinking water through lithium extraction is demonstrably a misrepresented problem. 11 avocados, or two beefsteaks, need as much water as a large battery for an electric car. In addition, there is enough lithium on Earth to electrify all cars, and with a 95% recycling rate, all the more so. And finally, lithium is not a necessary element for batteries for all eternity. And by the way, there are no rare earth materials in batteries at all. Anyway, let's stick to the somewhat emotional plus argument for the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle here. What is the current situation on the market? Most car manufacturers are clearly focusing on battery electric vehicles as the successor to the internal combustion engine. Yes, there are still a few exceptions like Toyota and Hyundai, but they are few and their sales figures are already drastically behind those of battery electric vehicles. Even of the brand new and quite attractive Mirai, Toyota, as the largest car manufacturer in the world, plans to sell only 30,000 units. In Germany, although it has over 60% of European hydrogen fueling stations, a mere 600 fuel cell electric vehicles are on the road, but already 180,000 battery electric vehicles. The growth rate from 2018 to 2019 in Germany was 64%, the year before 54, worldwide 42 and 55. The exponential growth is clearly visible. The market share is also growing exponentially. The hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles are heavily outperformed. According to surveys, almost everyone wants at a modern battery electric vehicle whose manufacturer has well organized the charging infrastructure, at the moment this is only Tesla and hopefully others soon, stays with it and does not switch back to the combustion engine and not to the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. 
If a comprehensive hydrogen infrastructure does not emerge now all of a sudden, internationally, which is as unlikely as it can be, the race is already over. 20 years ago, this opportunity existed when nobody knew how to build batteries with such high energy density and reliability. But now, most probably not. If we really want to become independent of the not very pleasant suppliers of crude oil one day, of the far from environmentally friendly crude oil industry, then we should not rely on a system for which we need three times as much renewable energy. With fuel cell electric vehicles, our chance of strategic energy independence would be very far off. After all the arguments, hydrogen mobility is the more expensive and less convenient solution for car drivers. So the car industry would have to force the majority of its customers to adopt a solution that is much more disadvantageous for them. So the idea is, let us do the complicated thing, the inefficient thing, and the expensive thing, so that we can save our industry. We will somehow be able to sell the customers that they will have to pay a lot more, will continue to have to go and pay the garage more often, and will only be able to fill up at few filling stations, business as usual. I can understand this argument. A great many of our clients are suppliers to the fossil fuel car industry and mechanical engineering companies. But that would be a very short-sighted and ultimately suicidal and deadly strategy. This could work if there were no competitors. Not only Tesla and many other Western manufacturers rely on battery electric vehicles for the future. China wants to replace combustion engines completely with battery electric vehicles. Hydrogen cars play almost no role in this, for exactly the reasons we are looking at here. To whom and how do we want to sell our hydrogen cars to the world when outside of some countries like Germany, hardly anyone is thinking about building a sufficient hydrogen infrastructure? Since car buyers are usually not stupid, the traditional automotive industry would commit suicide by focusing on hydrogen fuel cell cars. The customers would continue to drive their ICE cars and then gradually switch to battery electric vehicles, of which our great traditional manufacturers would have nothing convincing to offer. What was previously unimaginable could then easily happen. We would start buying significantly more cars from China. They are pretty excellent at electric cars. Take a look at the new Polestar from Volvo. This is a Chinese car. If the traditional car manufacturers would now really try to sell customers a system that is more expensive and less comfortable in several respects, we would not save a single job. We would rather achieve the exact opposite. Because of the global competition from BV, almost lost all jobs. Fortunately, however, the car industry is more informed and more reasonable than the proponents of hydrogen fuel cell cars. They have largely set them aside already. Some will say now that it is better not to buy a car at all. Yes, hardly anyone needs a ton or two or three of vehicle to get from A to B. But people want to have and want to buy cars, at least until the autonomous vehicles come along. Mind you, this is about cars, passenger vehicles and light trucks. But even Nikola, the yet-to-be manufacturer of hydrogen trucks, who has never built more than a prototype, has included purely battery-powered trucks in his imaginary lineup. Why? In addition to stationary use in manufacturing, ships and aircraft can be very suitable applications for traffic and transport. Even if, after decades of research, it is possible to make the production of hydrogen more efficient and cheaper, and find investors for literally thousands of hydrogen fueling stations all over the world within a very short time. New rules of physics would have to be found to make a hydrogen car better and cheaper from a customer's perspective than with a purely battery electric car. The idea of building a mix of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles and battery electric vehicles and the infrastructure is a nonsensical idea. Because even for only half of cars, you need the entire infrastructure. The cost disadvantages will be even greater. So if you read advertisements like, Tesla is defeated, here are the insider tips on hydrogen stocks. Well, I definitely refrain from those stocks. So my future assumption, not my forecast, is that in 2030, customers will not buy combustion engine cars, not hydrogen fuel cell electric cars, but by far better electric vehicles. And that the suppliers will follow this trend. 
What do you think? Do you have any further or better arguments? I look forward to reading your comments. If you find my assessments and my assumption convincing, please share this piece with your friends and in social networks, so that we all can look more realistically into the future and make better informed decisions. By the way, if you want your company to profit from the trends and technologies of the future and develop and implement a robust future strategy, I invite you to join my Leader Strategy Program. In this program, I will advise and guide you in rethinking and building a bright future of your company. Write me to help me explain the program to you. Have a bright future.